Why is recorded in front of a live studio audience. So don't worry, I found spooky haunted house music to play over I'm while so we talk. Glad. I think this I don't know if we should tell people who are listening or we should just act like we both showed up dressed up like Ted Lasso. Well, but are we gonna ever be on YouTube? Well we are, but I don't know. I just well love should the idea we actually dress there. up? No, I don't have a whistle. But oh, um <laughs> Do you have a tracksuit? Uh, no, I don't actually. Don't you want, well, I think we should dress up. This is what I wear when, when I mow the lawn. This. this is what I wear when I mow the lawn. Um, I totally have a great Russell outfit I could wear. So I I do like unfortunately. Like crushed my spirit. It crushed your spirit or I crushed your spirit? You crushed my spirit. I'm sorry. That we don't actually get to dress up for our Halloween episode. I know. This is why, with your hosts, Heidi Hedquist and Luke Poling. So, I, I do have some bad news for you. What? So, I sent you an article about uh, actor Brandon Cummings, who was the lead in a series of Let's Go Brandon themed gay porn videos. Yes. Who was arrested for beating up 35 neo Nazis. Yes. Which is a very specific number of neo Nazis. Very specific, yes. Not 34, not 36. 33 is right out. Um, so, apart from the fact that the use of apostrophes is atrocious, um, apparently this is all a. Um, this is all made up. Okay, it's not real. It's not real. There is no Brandon Cummings. There is That's no really series sad. of Let's Go Brandon uh, gay porn films, which you kind, kind of, of wish. Surprised at that. I feel there will be now. I, yes, but as I always, I, I feel like I'm constantly using this reference, but like a, a Venn, Venn diagram of people who are really into saying Let's Go Brandon and people mm-hmm. who are into gay porn videos. At first blush, one might think they are two completely separate circles, but we know right. they're, they do oh, meet they're somewhere. they're very intertwined at some point. Um, so, so basically, the thing that's most upsetting is that no neo-Nazis were hurt during the that's really a bummer. making of that rumor. And we're not a political show. No. No, but... Um, that really does crush my spirit, though. Yeah, you kind of wish somebody would just Where give a know? little tap. You know? Favorite holiday of the year, and just I don't know. Do you want to maybe right go? Maybe that's we should both dress up as um, gay porn star Brandon Cummings. We could for Halloween. Why not? Who else is gonna? Not Brandon, apparently. Yeah, he no. doesn't exist. Um, but if you do Google Brandon Cummings, someone does come up on LinkedIn. I haven't tried to. Oh, connect. we should find the real one <laughs> and just ask. Hey, hey, are you, you know, this guy? Wait, I was going to send you this. Did you see the woman, I saw this on Instagram, who <laughs> gifted everyone at her funeral Ouija boards and gave them a picture? So the program, this is amazing. I love this woman so much. I, I wish I, I'm going to copy off of her. Gave them a program with her picture when she's like 100 years old mm-hmm. and a Ouija board and said, let's keep in touch. That's amazing. Greatest thing ever. That is, that's so perfect. Right? Mm-hmm. We don't need that. no skeptics or we don't need no psychics. We No. Cut up the I middle man. it's fantastic. That's a great sense of humor. That's right? better than people who like record their own eulogy. No. This, this is, is way so better. Much better. Yeah. So much better. Can you imagine like walking in, you're all sad and trying to be, and right. then they go, this is from the deceased. That's right there. But I feel like if that is your kind of tip of the cap. Uh, Swan song. Not, yes, thank you. People are going to expect that something's up. You know True. what I mean? Like they're going to be, this is exactly, yep, this is this person. This, this is tracks. their spirit just coming yes. through loud and clear. In all aspects of the word. Yes, which you hope. We all hope that could be us at some point. Hopefully. Yeah. Um, it would make this spooky house that less spooky. I know. Why don't we have like the haunted mansion? Spooky. Um, 
because a lot of that music's copyrighted and I'm afraid, I'm afraid oh. we're going to get flagged. Um, but I think if you listen... Yeah, I can't hear any Randy um, spirits from last week's show that we talked about. Oh, Randy is in like horny Randy or yes, like R A N D Y, or like you killed our assistant. No, Randy R A N D Y. Yes. Um. Well, this is a terrible house. Then why are I know, we in this well, what, house? What what phrase do you think ghosts use? Do you think they use making whoopee, like they're on um on the Newlywood game? Because they can't use Bone Zone, right? Well, they can, but they probably would not find it funny. Yeah. I think, yeah, I think making Whoopi is pretty Probably, timeless. Yeah. Like, a, there's a ghost Bob Eubank somewhere with a... Oh, for sure. Very thin... He's, he's very, so alive, isn't he? I think so. I think we looked this up. Yeah. <laughs> Bob Barker also had a very thin microphone. He did, yes. That was his... I feel like Bob Barker and Gene Rayburn, too. Oh, yeah. But I think Bob Barker perpetuated the microphone longer, so he's yes. more closely associated with it. I agree. Ooh, I need to be somewhere with the Richard Dawson ghost. Oh, my God. Just making up with women everywhere. Yeah. Can you, can you imagine that show and that guy nowadays? I mean, I love Family Feud. He was the best host. A thousand percent. But I don't know how that would play now. But thank God we don't have to experience it now. Thank God That's we true. got to experience it when it was just... Plus he would have looked kind of weird nowadays with the super ruffled shirt. I know, but it was wonderful. Vest. Oh, it was great. Are you there, Richard Dawson? Right. Say survey says if you can hear us. <laughs> I don't think he's here. Maybe later. <laughs> <laughs> It, it seems like being located in Vegas, you have people coming in expecting certain things of the museum. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That this is this is not a live sex show. This is a, a, a real it, museum. It nailed it right on yeah. the head. <laughs> <laughs> ever, like, we had a guy come in yesterday just sort of like hinting around and my staff, they're like, it's not, li we're a museum. Like literally we're a museum. Oh, so nothing live. And she, she, you know, we, I let my staff be kind of a smart ass to questions like that at this point. And they're like, where in the word museum does it say live sex shows? Like, how do you tie the two together? And most people kind of like, okay, sorry. And they walk out. But being nice about it, people would challenge us and go, well, why wouldn't you do that? Et cetera. Right. Rather than staff kind of being berated for not having a live sex show or something in the museum, I go, be sassy. I don't, you're not going to get in trouble with me. <laughs> so, and that's worked a lot better for everyone. <laughs> well, how do you strike that balance as a, I believe, is your doctorate in, what is your doctorate in actually? I have actually? two doctorate degrees. Okay. Um, they're both in human sexuality. They just have different focuses. So my first doctorate degree is in uh, the practical. So in other words, clinic um, where I would do um, clinical work uh, in a therapist's office and so forth. And I actually was a therapist for a couple of years. Um, my second one is more of a research doctorate and that um, gets me into research labs. And it's just a different way of, of, of using the knowledge and how to apply it. Um, so my first doctorate is in human sexuality. Then my second one is in human sexuality with an emphasis on research and, and clinical. What, you. what drew you to the field? That is a really, really easy question to answer. Good. So <laughs> my father was an American GI. My mother is a German immigrant. Um, they actually did not meet in Germany while he was on, uh, you know, uh, on tour or whatever they call it. Um, he was a, a Air National Guard, Air National Guardsman. And my mother was a stewardess who was over here flying on Pan Am in the 60s. Okay. Now they're called flight attendants, but at the time they still had the pillbox. Hat. Yes. <laughs> and only reason to go into the field with the outfit. <laughs> <laughs> and um, they met through a, a pilot. Um, a, a Pan Am pilot who was a mutual friend of them both had a torrid love affair for like three months and oops, so long I was coming. <laughs> so, 
And they fought for 15 years to stay in a terrible marriage for my benefit, and they really shouldn't have. So um, thoughtful of them. Yeah, it was very thoughtful of Best them. Best plans. It was interesting when we kind of re. I mean, my parents separated when I was 10, and then my mother and I moved to Germany full time, and then my father stayed in Maine. And I didn't see them in the same room again until my children graduated from high school. Yeah. And I could never figure out, knowing my parents the way that I did, that how they ended up together and um and then i met then i had them both in the same place when my kids graduated from high school and i went oh even after all that time and he was remarried and she had a series of lovers and all that there was so much chemistry between wow. them it was so palpable and i went oh now i get uh -huh. it i like to joke around that i was born of passion and fire so love it, <laughs> it makes sense i'd go in this field right but that's actually not why i did my mother being german had a real different approach towards sex education than my father did right and i'm really grateful that most of my sex education was german in nature um and i remember i was about five years old we were still living in bangor maine and I came home uh, from kindergarten on the school bus and happened to ride on one of those humps in the school bus where the mm -hmm. wheel well is. Mm -hmm. It felt really funny. I'm like, why do I <laughs> feel funny? So I went into the, their bedroom. I came home and I ran into the bedroom and my mother, I still remember the green shag carpet and the orange yes. and brown swirly bed, bed um, cover and curtains. Oh my God. And she was ironing on the ironing board in front of the window and had her back to me. And I, was kind of dancing around uncomfortably and i'm like mommy mommy something's wrong i feel funny down there whatever and she sort of kind of turns halfway and she was like "Ugh, that's just you growing up and then went right back to ironing and that couldn't have been a more perfect parenting moment for a child who's trying to figure out what's going on with their body she told me without saying without having to like be explicit about it right that i was okay just mm -hmm. the way that i am around my sexuality but she didn't have to say all of that she just said it in a way that i understood as a five-year-old and she planted a the most wonderful seed that day that grew into the adult that i am which was one of ultimate self-acceptance and and through a series of you know um painful experiences as i was growing up as a teenager and so forth at the core of my being always was, I wanted to be able to give that to others the way my mom gave me to, that to me, because people carried so much shame around their sexuality. And I dealt with like violence as a teenager, you know, I was the victim of violence as a teenager. And the contrast between American sexual culture and German sexual culture is so vastly different. Oh, yeah. So much shame <laughs> and guilt in this country. It's that I just didn't even grow up with in Germany. I didn't come back till I was 16. Um, and the contrast was huge. So that was the motivator for me getting into the field. I just had to struggle with, you know, drug and alcohol addiction in my 20s first before I could get back to who I was as an individual. Because being that accepting and, and trying to give that to others, um, not everybody wants to have that interaction you know they, right. they they look at it as vulnerability and weakness and they want to attack it and we see that we have that all the time at the museum where when we you know people talk to us about general stuff and some get hostile when we go you know what um everybody's different you know we try to have that that ideal at the museum and it's not always met favorably some people you know have come into the museum screaming that we're sinners and that we're corrupting everyone and and you know we, we get hate mail and all that kind of stuff so um but our that mission or that message that my mom gave me as a kid i try to have as an everyday part of the messaging that um the museum puts out into the world if that makes sense so funny because those are the people i feel like if they would just pay attention and be a little more comfortable and laid back about things, they wouldn't be so angry. <laughs> <laughs> Just enjoy yourself a little bit. Right. <laughs> right. And, you know, and I also study paraphilias. That's, uh, you know, my uh, PhDs were both in um, the kink community online where ter terror, fear, death play, and so forth. So the real, real, real like um, edge play, right, um, is what I studied. Uh, because I really wanted to understand sexuality from its most 
Hmm. From the place most people hide. Sure. All right. Uh, and um, because I just thought maybe there's something there that the regular, you know, regular research doesn't capture. When you talk about oral sex 101, how to please your lover, go to the store and get this handcuff thing, whatever. I'm just like, mm, I'm, to me, that's just scratching the surface. I want to go to the really, really, really dark places of, of, of human psychology and find out what's going on there. Um, and I think even in those spaces, what I found uh, amongst the kinksters anyway, is that their maladaptive behavior, some of the psychological challenges that they had when they found a community where they could express themselves in a safe, consensual place, mm -hmm. those issues resolved themselves or were markedly reduced. Right? Go figure. Right, right, yeah. exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and that's in, you know, and, and now we're having more mainstream conversations around that. I just attended a conference at Tashra virtually where they specifically were going over the ethical considerations of edge play and consensual non-consent. So people are finally talking about these spaces that I started researching two decades ago, right? So it's nice to see people talking about how do we make it safer? We're not going to stop people from doing it. How do we make it safe, consensual, and, and ethical, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that's a really great direction that we're going. And it's ongoing, obviously. So. Yeah, of course. Please. Well, I'm assuming that that interest and that kind of fascination is a, a very good uh, helper when it comes to curating a sex museum, erotic <laughs> history museum. Um, and the exhibits you have, I mean, it really covers the gamut of erotic history. There's, uh, I believe it's pronounced, is it Legba? The fawn of the, the goddess for the fawn people of Benin, Africa? Oh, Legba. Like, yeah. uh, to Emperor Tiberius, to Weimar, Germany. I mean, you, you cover a lot. What has been your favorite to really dig in and explore? It's changed over the years. Mm. Um, when I first got to the museum as director, now you got to remember I was there as a, a student intern from 09 on, right, with a brief stint working for Mr. Moni, who owns the museum and his his clubs, which was not a good fit for me at all. Um, but I tried. Uh, but but since 14, I've been the director. And the first exhibit that I was really passionate about um, at the museum when we reopened was this sort of combo um, um, Second World War, Weimar Republic, um, sexual culture in particular because of the difference between the way the Weimar Republic approached, and of course I'm German, so it has some personal importance to me, sure. uh, the way the Weimar era approached sexuality and how drastically it changed during Hitler's reign in Germany, and the way in which sexuality was used to suppress um, uh, the people of Germany and how that sort of came before um, what later became the concentration camps and so forth. It, were, it was political dissidents and sexual minorities that went to the camps originally. Um, and then it got worse over time. And that whole thing with, you know, um, uh, what happened in, in, in Germany during the, the uh, Second World War and, and prior when Nazis came to power, which was uh, you know, keeping Jewish folks and non-Jewish folks apart. And if you reproduced as a German, pure, a pure German with a Jewish person, then you were, and it's in all of the documentation, you were a race defiler, you were sent to the camps it's, you, for falling in love and having a child. That's it, you know, that's all. Right. That's what you were punished for and sent to the camps for. So, um, so that was a, a real... Uh, that was momental, uh, monumental for me to do because of some of the things that we've seen in the United States. And, mm -hmm. you know, as a German kid growing up, and I consider myself German because most of my formative years were, were there, oh. um, especially around sexuality, uh, the similarities between what I grew up with learning and what I saw here around things like uh, reproductive choice, gay, lesbian, and trans issues, etc., all look really familiar. 
from what I grew up with in the 80s in, in Germany. Um, so then we moved on and then uh, we put in the uh, the Fawn Tribe exhibit, which I was, I it's just, it, sexual history is very Anglo-Saxon, Greek, Roman, etc. There's not a lot looking at um, countries outside, or, you know, eras outside of that. So to have something um, that expanded our worldview on sexuality and how people deal with sexuality, um, as my curator at the time was was developing it and putting it in, I didn't have any hand in it. She did all of it. I was fascinated by um, some of the research that she was coming up with around sexual culture and reproduction and fertility and stuff in non-Anglo-Saxon areas of the world. And then um, most recently, my favorite one has been the Garden of Earthly Delights. It sounds amazing. Yeah, I, I wanted to do something that was that included a lot of animatronics um, and the museum had never done anything like that before. And we had had other exhibits in there in the sort of center round area that we have there. Um, we had the Jeff Gord exhibit. We had the Star Wars XXX exhibit. Then we had the uh, World's Largest Sex Bike exhibit for five years. And I wanted, I, I thought to myself, how do I bring to life the ethos of the museum in physical form? How do I do that? And I don't remember who made the suggestion about Hieronymus Bosch's piece, um, The Garden of Earthly Delights. So I just started, this was like years ago, I think it was three or four years ago, we started conceptualizing this and I had never done a centerpiece exhibit in a museum. And I thought, you know, I'm not, I'm not a curator. I'm an administrator, I'm a sexologist, I'm a researcher, I'm not a curator, but I'm gonna, we were heading into the pandemic. Um, we were closed for quite a while. And I thought to myself, well, let's just run with this. And um, we combined some of the elements from the bike exhibit, the forest and everything, which was a really great anchor. <clears throat> and we, um, I just started adding elements like I've started pulling pieces out of not only the original Hieronymus Bosch piece, but also uh, some modern digital interpretations of it. So we took some of the characters from the original piece and from modern digital reinterpretations and made them animatronic. And um, it took a long time because everything sort of came to a screeching halt during the yeah. pandemic. I just said, look, we're going to do this one piece at a time. And then one day it was done. I mean, I once spent a week making the lake and the, the stream for, by hand because we had all the animatronics in, but I'm like, there's a river in the original piece. I wanna add that, you know, whatever my interpretation is. And um, next thing I knew it was complete and we opened it. And I, I don't know that it was something that we wanted that, that I wanted to have in there to gain any kind of notoriety. It was just, the museum and my interpretation of what is pleasure and how do we lose ourselves in it and how bizarre can it be and can it be beautiful in its bizarreness and mm -hmm. that's what that exhibit i think communicates i don't know that everybody gets it but um that's not the point the point is is to create a, a space where the ethos of the museum and then sort of my own my own personal interpretations of pleasure and um, paradise manifest themselves in physical form. Have we, have, as a species, always found the same things erotic? Or to put it maybe another way, have our anacondas always not wanted to have none unless you've got buns on? <laughs> That's really a great question. Well, Diane Sawyer's not asking these. No. <laughs> Well, let me throw a lot. I'm going to throw a music idea back at you. Hit us. And um, I actually looked up a paper in Science Daily um, from from 17. That was the story of music is the story of humans. And I would I, my my response to you would be, has music always been something that is universal over the course of time in different cultures? And the answer would be no, there's so much change and diversity and evolution in music, the same as for sex. Um, is, are, is the act of reproduction the same? Yeah, because that's, that's how we keep reproducing, right? And even in, in uh, 
non-human species and humans alike, um, those behaviors, whether gay, straight, um, are the same. But the way in which they express themselves changes all the time and changes from one place to the next. What do you think dictates it as far as in the same place, how it evolves over time? Well, let's let's take um, let's take the United States as an example, right? If we yeah. must, no, uh, we're <laughs> well, maybe so, we're a good example. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, let's I mean, let's go to the 1950s. You know, you had very much a focus on the family, on, right. on um, the nuclear family, the white picket fence, etc. Especially in post-war the uh, U.S. Um, and that's of course where you had the boomer generation um, that was very focused on that, and also the rebuilding after World War II heavily influenced sexuality, both around quote unquote illicit sexuality, VD as they used to call it and, and um, sex work and so forth. And then this contrast of what was underground and what everybody was trying to present themselves as, you know. Then of course you get into the 60s and 70s where you have subversive culture that comes up and, and you know, a flips its finger at the prior generation and then you have the free love generation the american sexual revolution etc birth control becomes legal and widely available um reproductive choice of course is legalized during uh for in roe v wade uh or protected i should say and um so the sexual culture changed you started having a lot of um, non-traditional uh family units <clears throat> sex wasn't just relegated to marriage anymore. Uh, women could uh, choose to not get married or have children later. And that sort of has continued. Then you start getting into the, you know, my generation where we were left alone a lot and mm -hmm. we were, we were experimenting with everything. I mean, look at the, at, you know, the Oops. Gen X era in the eighties with like the post punk um, era and so forth, where we were all sort of just left to our own devices to figure out who we were, not only as people, but as sexual people, you know. Figure um, out where all the playboys and playgirls were hidden in everybody's houses. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, it was a time of experimentation and it was unguided. You know, we weren't, we weren't, the, my generation wasn't fighting against a prior generation. We didn't have anyone to fight against. We were just kind of like, whatever i guess we'll just figure it out as we go yeah. along there was no guidance right um and you have my children my children are both in their 30s now um you know they were dealing with helicopter parents i be, you know i was so out of control as a teenager especially that i had you know drug and alcohol addiction issues as a teen and young adult um i became somewhat of a helicopter parent where i was like i go to school with them. i mean all the way till my kids graduated high school i walked to the bus stop with them in the morning and i picked them up in the afternoon didn't matter what was going on because i wanted to make sure that what i there were downsides to being that uncontrolled right i'm glad mm. i got to do to experiment in the way that i wanted to at that age but there were consequences to that that were pretty severe and i wanted to guide my children not leave them completely to their own devices and i don't blame my parents for the choices that they made you know i when you get to be my age you get over that stuff but um i wanted to make sure that my my kids were not experimenting without someone to go to and go uh this kind of happened mom and uh right and that's the relationship i still have with my children you know i still get they call me up and go, you know, I'm navigating this relationship and so forth. And I don't tell them what to do. I go, well, here's what worked for me and what didn't work for me. And, you know, you've seen how I've kind of stumbled. Sometimes I've been successful and not. Um, my daughter has two kids who are 10 and eight. Um, I'm not exactly sure. I don't meddle in how she raises them. She's a good mom. Um, she's hardworking. She's a nurse in Texas. And I'm not sure how she's teaching them or if it's even been an issue yet around sexuality, but I'm guessing given that she's a, a nurse that she's probably coming at it from that perspective, you yeah. know, sort of medical and, and, uh, and that's probably just as valid as any other. So I, I think it's really um, looking at sexuality has a lot to do with the culture at the time and how, what sexual culture is at that point, right? All we have to do is look at our own generational yeah sequences to find that. 
You find that most people who come to the museum, I know you've got the naysayers and the people that just want to have their voices heard and tell you you're wrong. But do you find most people come in already with a pretty solid knowledge of just human sexuality and the you know, history and things like that? Or do you find most people are just really curious for more? The These second, already fans, okay. The second one, um, a lot of people come into the museum not knowing what to expect because our exterior looks like sort of a, a rundown strip club <laughs> with all the neon and uh -huh. the, you know all that um so we're and we're working on like redoing our exterior um we've just like spent a lot of money on the parking lots and we did the redid the big marquee and now we're thinking about exterior work but so people come in sort of like and of course we've got puppetry the penis signs yes. and naked boy singing signs on the outside right so people come in and they're like Okay, this is going to be just another Vegas attraction that's just a, 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 a wasteland of degeneracy, right? And <laughs> then they go into the museum and see that we are an art, science, and history museum that's heavily based in research, and uh, we follow museum best practices like any big museum would or public institution. And the thing that we hear from people the most when they come out is, wow, this is a real museum. <laughs> Uh, wow, I actually learned something in there. Oh. Um, and wow, I didn't know that sex could be taken so seriously and be done in such an educational and straightforward way. I was really comfortable in there. And then the last one they come out is like, why is there so much to read? <laughs> <laughs> We're like, well, education's kind of like that. There's yeah. a lot of when you're educating. <laughs> Yeah, How do you but strike those are that pretty balance? Much the four um, responses we get. So I think people come in with expectations that are salacious and seedy, and then they walk out going, I didn't know about this, I didn't know about that. And you guys have done it in a really sciencey kind of way. That's really awesome. So that's cool. Yeah. I was going to say, how do you strike that balance between keeping people interested and still presenting to them quality research, quality educational? displays um or is it just that sex is interesting to anybody yeah, well, no matter yeah. how you yeah, yeah sex is really interesting i think uh yeah I, you're correct there and i would add um uh, just because we're sciencey and very rooted in research and academia um we do have some exhibits in the museum that let's say they poke the bear Okay. Mm -hmm. um, they're not salacious, but they're definitely uh, could be interpreted as offensive. Uh, definitely. And, mm -hmm. um, and those are right when you walk in. <laughs> those are the first thing. And I remember arguing with my boss about that, the owner of the museum. I'm like, maybe we could move the, and he was like, trust me on this one. Okay. Just trust me on this. And, and he was right. Uh, we put the offensive stuff right at the front door. Right when people first yeah. walk in, so they're like, <gasps> and then they start walking around the rest of it. They go, oh, oh, wait a minute. So we've gotten them riled up, right? We've gotten all that adrenaline going, uh -huh. and then they start looking at the rest, and they go, wait a minute, there's actually stuff to learn here. So he was right in in that suggestion. <laughs> so it nice. keeps people interested because they get mad when they walk through the door. Right, <laughs> freaked out. That's awesome. Yeah. <clears throat> and it's got to be nice for you to be recognized for your work and for the museum i noticed you were named one of the most influential lgbt iqa activists in 2021 i believe it was i think it was 19. oh 19. i mean it's not long ago yeah, yeah. it's we n neither one of us have that honor so no. you know we don't have any honors though, yeah so we're splitting hairs here. <laughs> um do you feel that kind of pressure in running this museum to try to address all forms of sexuality, all that everyone is represented in some form? Um, let me answer that. There's two parts to that question. So let me answer the first part, which is the recognition. Um, I, I have to be honest with you, I sort of marvel at the accolades that I get. You know, of course, we um, we're signed to a reality show uh development deal back in 20 
in late 20 that um, I, I, as far as I can tell, the pilot will be released uh, in the spring of next year. And we've done some filming and stuff. Um, I, I, I just do what I'm passionate about. Like I'm, I'm, and other people that have attached themselves to the museum have, have done so because they sought fame. Um, I've never, I've never been impressed by fame. I've never been motivated by fame. To me, I would, it would make me really miserable to be pursuing rec recognition and fame. I just don't operate that way. Like I'm a loner who likes to be in her house in the after, in the evenings after work and, you know, play video games or read comic books or hang out with my pets or what, you know, I'm like kind of this like reclusive nerd. Um, and I like it that way. Like I'm not looking <laughs> to go to parties and travel all over. Well, traveling. Yes. But um, so, so the fame recognition aspect it, more, every time it happens, I go, Ooh, why is that? You know, I just, it, it, I don't understand. I'm just doing what I love to do. I don't know why I can't logically wrap my head around why people keep saying, Oh, look here, we're going to give you another award. And I'm like, but I'm wh why <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. I just want to, um, you know, my father being in the service uh, was really big on public service. And that's what I was raised with is, you know, like I was the kid who was told, grab up all your toys. We're going to go donate those because mm -hmm. you have privilege and you are very lucky to have the life that you have. And I learned that from a really early age from my dad. Right. And then of course the influence of, uh, what I learned in Germany and the horrors of, of, you know, that the horrors of what people can be capable of. Right. I just always yeah. wanted to, in Germany, there's this attitude, at least that I grew up with, which is life is suffering and we are capable of hurting each other in horrific ways. And it's your job as an individual to find the beauty and the the preciousness of life. And if you can add to that, never mm. add the negative or the horrific, always add the, leave behind something better than what you found. And those two messages are the core of why I do what I do until I can't do it anymore. Right. Um, as for the second part, striking a balance between making sure everyone is, or tr making sure everyone is represented um, because sexuality evolves so quickly and there are so many aspects to it. I don't know that the museum is ever going to be caught up ever, <laughs> uh, but we try. And when someone comes in and says, Hey, I don't see this represented here or that represented here. It goes into our, our, our list and go, okay, when we free up some space here, we're going to add that next. And we're going to add that. So I think we're always going to be behind but we're always going to try to make sure everybody's voice is included in the museum. It's just part of the ethos of the museum because sex is so diverse and um, multifaceted. Sexology itself is a multidisciplinary uh, scientific endeavor. Biology, anthropology, uh, um, uh, psychology. I mean, I would even argue physics is in there. You sure. know, mm -hmm. and cosmology, and uh, I mean, there's so many ways. At, we we don't look at sex through the lens of psychology. We look at sex through every single lens, right? right? I would argue that we're probably the most multidisciplinary scientific endeavor out there, but I'm biased, so I'll admit that. <laughs> <laughs>
Nigel, is that you? Are you here, Nigel? For more information on the plan your visit, check out the website for the Erotic Heritage Museum, eroticmuseumvegas.com.